Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Khaldun Azari. I am former president, and I am a member of the great library committee that organized this wonderful event, book break. Thank you very much. I think uh, the title of our event is known to everybody. It's uh, Gentlemen from Japan, the, United, the untold story of an incredible uh, journey from Asia to Queen Elizabeth's court. I think there's a lot of uh, details to be uh, told. And our author guest today is Mr. Thomas Luckley. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you, sir. And I, I thanked him very much in the ante room to uh, attract about 50 wonderful people to our event. We are trying to have more events in the club because this will give our club back, uh, uh, it bring it back to our great days, and also it gives us a little more business and more attention. Thank you for coming again. And of course, the author today will talk about uh, his book in English. We have the copy here, and we have many copies uh, there for uh, you know, your attention. You can buy at a reduced price and get the signature after the event. And he will also, after the presentation, he will give a chance to, to your questions, maybe half and half. We have 75 minutes. And uh, he will give a presentation for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then Q&A. And uh, Gentlemen from Japan is the first book uh, to focus on the beginning of uh, relations between Japan and the English-speaking world between 1587 and uh, 1592. And uh, it follows the life of Christopher, as the English named him, uh, an enslaved Japanese man in service to the Spanish who was captured by English pirates of California and taken to London. It's very exci exciting stories. I will not uh, spoil it. <laughs> I will let him talk about it, but really it's, it's amazing. And uh, Thomas is uh, an associate professor at Nihon University. We have some students here. Thank you for coming also. And uh, it's at uh, Nihon University where he, teach, he research and teach uh, themes related to the international history of Japan, especially those stories that have slipped between the cracks of recorded history. Uh, he has published uh, numerous papers, contributed to Ministry of Education, uh, approved textbooks, and written several books. He also Best known, uh, one of these books is best known, uh, it's African Samurai, and uh, co-authored also with uh, Jeffrey Jira in uh, 2019. And uh, we, we will have a lot of information about uh, such uh, extra uh, books, and uh, we will le learn more about it. Thank you very much again, and uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we will start our event. Please. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank, you. Thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Uh, it's a great honor to be speaking here again after probably five years since African Samurai was uh, also presented here in front of uh, such a august, wonderful audience. Um, I think... Um, I would like to say thank you to old friends who've come tonight, to new friends, to students, to people I haven't seen for four or five years, and for people that I hope to meet again in the future. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions uh, at the end, and um, I look forward to taking your questions. So I normally stand up when I'm speaking, so it's slightly unknowing to be sitting down <laughs> But I'm told that the microphone won't work so well if I stand up, so I'm going to try and sit down. But if in the middle I stand up <laughs> and start moving around, please, please forgive me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so a gentleman from Japan, the untold story of an incredible journey from Asia to Queen Elizabeth's court. Ah. The year is November 1588, London, England. And a gentleman of Japan, so-called, called Christopher, attended Queen Elizabeth I's court. 
no Japanese ship had ever navigated outside Asia, and no English ship had yet reached East Asia. So who was Christopher? How did he come to be in front of Queen Elizabeth I at a time when nobody could even really conceive of Japanese and English people meeting, let alone in England? How did he come to be in London? This is Christopher's story, as yet untold, I hope. I hope nobody corrects me on that one. <laughs> Gentlemen from Japan. And there will be plenty of copies later on. Um, there are a lot more people here than I thought there would be. If people want a copy and we run out, please give me your meshi and I will send one to you in the post. So don't worry, there's plenty more where these came from uh, back in my office. Um, Okay, place is California, which at that time was generally considered to be an island. And the place in California is right at the bottom here, Cape uh, Cabo San Lucas, or Cape San Lucas in English. And on July the 2nd, 1587, the Spanish galleon Santa Ana left Manila heading for Acapulco. A few months later, in November, on the 4th of November, off Bayer, California, the English pirate Thomas Cavendish attacks and takes Santa Ana. It was a long battle, lasted nearly a day, but in the end, it was successful from the English point of view. Abducted. This is the record from Hacklett, who is the primary recorder of English exploits around the world at the time. But before Cavendish's departure, he took out of this great ship, two young lads born in Japan, which could both write and read their own language. The eldest being about 20 years old was named Christopher. The other was called Cosmos, about 17 years of old, uh, years of age, both of very good capacity. And these are words which come back again and again throughout the book. So how did Christopher come to be on a Spanish galleon in California? That's a long way from Japan at the time. No Japanese ship had ever crossed, as far as we know, the Pacific uh, and wouldn't do for another 25 odd years. So it's kind of surprising that uh, Christopher happens to be the first ever Asian person recorded on the continent of North America at this point. This is This is the point where we first see an Asian person in North America. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context so you can maybe understand this mind boggling story. We we'll start in Manila. Manila was a very, very new Spanish outpost at this time. Uh, 1521 Magellan had navigated the Pacific Ocean, uh, the first known European to have done so. And it took another 44 years uh, for the first Spanish colony to be uh, established on Cebu Island. Very shortly afterwards, the first route, because this colony was only about connections between Asia and the Americas, the first route was uh, established between Asia uh, and America. This is the first time that the world could be encircled in a trade route or a cultural exchange route. It never happened before. This is a major date in world history. 1571, Manila was conquered. Uh, it had been an Islamic uh, sultanate before that, and it became a territory of New Spain. So this means that actually Manila was being ruled from Mexico City, and the galleons from Manila to Acapulco were under the control of Mexico City as well. Manila was an outpost and was barely surviving. Uh, there were several and probably more than we're, we know about from the records, uh, Chinese and Japanese pirate attacks. Manila was burnt down uh, both by mistake and by Chinese pirates and by Japanese pirates later on after this as well. Um, it was a touch and go thing. Um, but the lifeblood of Manila was this galleon, which we can see here, uh, would lead it's called Nao de Hina, the uh, ship of China, basically. It would leave 
and it would pass Japan over the northern Pacific Oceans on the currents, the Kuroshio current here, and it would come roughly to where Monterey in, is in California, now down the Californian coast to Acapulco. The return journey was much easier. Uh, the currents and the winds go straight across. Interestingly enough, the last thing that Christopher would have seen of Japan as he was, try this one, as he was coming uh, past Japan, he would have seen Mount Fuji. This is almost always recorded on the Spanish galleons. The only part of Japan they could see was Fuji's tip as they were past Japan. So they knew they were leaving Asia. This was the sign that Asia was being left. left. And after Christopher, many hundreds, possibly thousands of Japanese people crossing, um, almost all of them enslaved to Mexico, would have seen Mount Fuji as their last site uh, of Japan. Context, again, Japan. We are in Sengoku Jidai, the age of the country at war. It's brutal. It's not a good time to be alive in Japan. There is a total collapse of any kind of central government. Piracy and banditry are rife. Uh, human trafficking from Japan by Portuguese people started, uh, is recorded to have started in the 1540s. Uh, there was almost definitely plenty of human trafficking outside of Japan by Japanese mariners and Chinese mariners before this as well. Uh, the Portuguese were just the ones that we have the records for. These people mainly, the victims mainly came from Western Japan often from what we know as of, uh, know of as the Shimabara Peninsula, Arima, uh, Omura, places like that. And we know that also in Manila, going back to Manila, there were enslaved Japanese people in Manila from the 1570s onwards. That's right at the beginning of the Manilan uh, settlement. So they were there from the beginning. By the 1580s, uh, there are records um, of around about a thousand uh, people, mainly children, being trafficked from Japan each year. Uh, from normally from Nagasaki. By this point, Nagasaki became a port in 1581. Um, Macau, Manila, and Southeast Asia were the most um, developed markets, if you can put it that way. Um, for human trafficking from Japan. India, Africa, Mexico, Peru, and Europe all had parts in this as well. But as we can see, Mexico would have been where Christopher ended up if he hadn't been caught by English pirates. This is a painting from the time. This is actually from the Osaka no Jin. Uh, I think it's the Natsu no Jin, uh, the Osaka siege in 1615. We can see here um, people being rounded up at the end of spears. We can see people being um, brutalized, uh, chased by swords. And it is thought that these people here were being rounded up to be sold as slaves, essentially, which is the normal course of affair, affairs during that time in Japanese history. So we've had some context there. Who was Christopher? I concluded in a research paper that I wrote originally in, I think it was about 2017, uh, and it's published in 2019. Christopher was an enslaved Japanese mariner on the Santa Ana. All the evidence points to this, though there are some questions, there are some outstanding questions which we'll come on to later on. So we go to the English context. Uh, how did Thomas Cavendish, the English mariner, come to be in California at a time when no English person had ever been anywhere near California? Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, the second, yes, Drake, Drake had been in California previously. However, it was an unusual thing, a very unusual thing. It was only the second time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we go to some English context now. England was at the time, like Japan, a troubled realm. There was a lot of issues. It was an isolated outlier in Europe, few friends. Uh, this is almost all to do with Catholic and Protestant issues and the fact that England refused to, shall we say, make up uh, with the uh, continental powers who were all at this time Catholic. The only exception, of course, was the Dutch Republic, which was at the time a rebel province of Spain, essentially, 
uh, therefore England was in dire straits. A weak economy, social ills, all sorts of other problems. So if you haven't got friends nearby, what do you do? You try and find new friends. And this is where the idea of contact with Japan or Cathay or the Indies came in. It had been a European dream and an English dream since at least Columbus's time. Columbus was, of course, actually trying to find Japan when he bumped into the Americas. Uh, he thought he died thinking he'd found Japan. Uh, we now know that's not entirely true. Um, English writings from the time um, detailed in, in the book will show you that the English thought that contacting East Asia, especially Japan and China, would be a kind of panacea, a kind of cure for all the ills. It would be the equivalent of what the Spanish found in Mexico and South America, uh, um, flows of gold, except they wouldn't take them by force like the Spanish had done, because of course they couldn't. They would trade for these and they would um, coax the riches from Japan. It was going to be the answer to all England's problems. And as such, there were quite a few writings that started to appear along the way. Uh, the first ever time Japan or a description of Japan is mentioned in English is the history of the travel, uh, tra travel I think, in the West and East Indies in 1577. Um, 1579, the first ever translation of Marco Polo comes out in English. Uh, I assume that many English people would have read it before, but in different languages. Uh, Spanish was the most prevalent of the translations available in English, and indeed the English translation was done from the Spanish rather than from any original. Then in 1584, 85 and 86, Japan comes to Europe for the first time. Catholic Europe, not England, not Protestant Europe, Catholic Europe was toured by Tencho Embassy, four boys from what is now Kyushu. It was a sensation. There was several hundred publications, pictures, uh, all sorts of media were released over Europe to announce this amazing uh, event. Some people even said that these were kings of the East, Meiji, uh, almost something biblical. This was an amazing event. Queen Elizabeth, though, didn't get into this because of course it was Catholic Europe that was being toured and Queen Elizabeth was not on that um, that list of countries. Uh, it is said and there is some, well, there's quite a lot of evidence, uh, some of which is in the book, to suggest that Queen Elizabeth was really angry that didn't, she didn't get in on this wonderful tour of Europe by the Tenshaw uh, Embassy and therefore Christopher is again put in to, well, a lot of Christopher's story becomes clear later on when we think of how Elizabeth was thinking about the Tensho Embassy. English attempts uh, for East Asia, I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, they were so many and they'd been everywhere. They tried to get everywhere and they hadn't managed to get above Canada, above Siberia, below um, the Americas. Um, nobody as yet had tried. Uh, around Africa, though Fenton thought about it, but it wasn't a good idea. Uh, he ended up in a real mess and he did just about get back, but most of his crew didn't. In all of this, Drake manages to get around South America for the first time. And although it was a mistake, he hadn't planned to do this, he then managed to cross the Pacific Ocean and reach what is now Indonesia. Um, he found all the herbs and spices that he'd been wanting to. And rather than doing anything serious, he just went back for England. It took him a long time, but he went around South Africa and came back um, 1580, I believe it was. A lot of people had tried, including Fenton, this Fenton down the bottom here, to copy him over the next few years. Very few had got anywhere. Cavendish. Um, and there is some evidence to suggest that Cavendish may even have been on Drake's voyage, um, though it, it's um, not entirely convincing, I have to say. Anyway, he set up his own voyage to be the first person planning to circumnavigate the world. The only two people or the two missions to have done this before did it by mistake. 
um, it had not been planned. Cavendish was going to be the first to do this in a planned way. Off he went. Uh, on the way, he meets Christopher in California and they head to England. This is a map on which it is recorded. Excuse me. I'm going to try and do this on both of them. We can see uh, again the island of California, which reaches almost to Canada here. Um, uh, this is the, the wiggly route. They've gone across the Pacific, through the Philippines, through Indonesia, around South America, uh, South Africa, and then they come up, you can see it on the other side here, to England, uh, California here, and all the way around South Africa, up to England. They arrive in Plymouth just after the Spanish Armada has been defeated. This is a pivotal moment in English history, and it must have seemed almost provident that on September the 9th, only two or three months after the Spanish Armada had gone past and been defeated, that these noble visitors, as they were described in the literature, visited from Japan. Coincidentally, just the same as the Tensho people had a few years before, Queen Elizabeth was to be a very happy queen and Cavendish was supposed to get a knighthood and everybody was supposed to be happy. This is the original French version, uh, we, well, not the original, the original was in English, we don't have the English version left anymore, the only version we have left was from a Paris a Parisian translation. Uh, he also brought with him some gentlemen, Indians, meaning Asians, and comment dit de le propre mouvement et franche volonté, they came of their own volition, they wanted to come, they came as the Venetian ambassador later reported through a desire to meet the queen this the desire to meet the queen part is um in the calendar of state papers uh in england so um we don't have the original phoenician or italian version we only have the english translation but it's a lovely little part to finish off the french there they ended up a month after arriving in England, customs dealt with all the issues dealt with in Greenwich. And Greenwich was the royal palace of the time, the, the country palace. Um, Whitehall was the city palace. Uh, it looked something like this, very much different from the very grand building we see today at Greenwich. Um, it, quite a sleepy country palace. The ship that Christopher was on with the other um, Asians that came with him um, on November the 12th pulled up outside Greenwich Palace. We know that, uh, sorry, it was decked out in blue silk and cloth of gold, which were the most expensive cloths which could be found at the time and conveniently had all been on the Spanish ship. Uh, so they were stolen. It was fence goods, very South London for anybody that knows South London. Uh, fence goods um, coming up and making a big um, display. We know that Queen Elizabeth dined aboard five days later. What we do not have any evidence of exactly is that she met them. It is in inconceivable that she didn't meet them. She had wanted to meet Japanese people for years, Asian people for years, and they were there on the same ship. They were going to be used as, um, they were going to attend to her. That's what it was. But the problem was, they weren't gentlemen, of course, they were enslaved people and this was very quickly discovered again the records are deleted we don't have any records of all of this whether it's done on purpose or whether the records have since been lost is unclear however what we do see later on in the london of the 1580s is lots of records of christopher and his four colleagues but they get to be called other things not gentlemen anymore Richard Hacklett, again, he's the chronicler of these times. Uh, he rewrote his introduction uh, to, the sh to his great book, uh, which was only published a few, day uh, few months later. He rewrote it to say, is it not strange that the born naturals of Japan are here to be seen agreeing with our climate? It had been raining when they arrived. Spe <laughs> Very London again. Uh, speaking our language and informing us of the state of their eastern habitations. 
we have a merchant called Robert Park. But since it is so, as we understand that your worship, that's Thomas Cavendish, having brought home two young fellows of good capacity born in the mighty island of Hapon, which hereafter may serve as our interpreters in our first traffic thither. We can see from these two, number one, these young men speak English. Number two, they are happy with the rain. And number three, they are informing us of the state of the eastern habitations. They were being used as intelligence. This is because the English had little or no knowledge of the Far East at the time. And these lads were to be set up as interpreters. Any future voyage which the English could manage uh, to Asia, which was unclear at the time, uh, we can look back now and we can see that there are millions of them after this, but we didn't know that in this time. These young men were to be used as interpreters for the English and set up as a kind of diplomatic service, if you look. They came to be called naturalists instead. Naturalist is something similar to what we would now call a scientist or a scholar. And the reason why they changed the nomenclature from gentleman, which had been proved to be false, to naturalist is because the things that they could teach the English were absolutely astonishing for the English. Magnetism, one of the cutting edge technologies of the time, it may seem slightly weird that magnetism was a cutting edge technology, was a, a science that needed to be studied by the English because the compasses that the English had at the time were woefully inadequate. They didn't work very, very well. They worked even less well a few months out of port because the lodestones needed to magnetize the compasses were too valuable to be taken on ships. So uh, weeks or months out of England, the English found it very difficult to know where they were or, or which direction they were heading in. Um, William Barlow, he was a, a, um, a priest, but also what we call now a scientist, a naturalist, decided to deal with this. And he basically met everybody he could find and consulted with them about better forms of magnets. In his book, which was called The Navigator's Supply, concerning many things of principal importance, belonging to navigation with a description and the use of diverse instruments, very catchy title, uh, he wrote, there's several, of, there's several references to Christopher in his book, but this is the main one. Some few years since, it so fell out that I had several conferences with two East Indians who were brought into England by Master Cavendish and had learned our language. One of them was of Manila. This is one of his colleagues from Manila in the Isle of Luzon. The other of Miyako in Japan. That's Kyoto in the modern day. I questioned with them concerning their shipping and manner of sailing. They described all things far different from ours. Again, we see the English getting intelligence, as much intelligence as they can uh, in the right places. This is a Chinese compass of the time. William Barlow actually wrote a description of how Christopher helped him uh, experiment with a Chinese compass. Um, this is a very basic mariner's compass. The, the full compass is a diviner's compass and it's much bigger. Um, but this is the compass here on the bottom left, bottom right, sorry. Um, the type that Christopher showed to William Barlow is in a dish of porcelain, or probably pottery in those days because porcelain wasn't available in England. Um, and there is a magnetized fish uh, shaped needle in the middle. Simply it points to the south because Chinese compasses don't point to the north, they point to the south. So the head would have pointed to the south and the north would have been the tail. And that was it. That was what Christopher demonstrated to William Barlow and it's written down in his book. The only problem with this compass, because this is what William Barlow eventually ended up making, there's no liquid in it. The only problem with the water compass is everywhere the English wanted to go was frozen and cold. And so this compass wouldn't work uh, anywhere the English really wanted or need, needed to go. Um, therefore, it was another two or three hundred years before the English developed a liquid compass uh, by putting alcohol into the water to make the freezing point much lower. 
which is the same compass as we basically use today. Unfortunately, Christopher couldn't give any clues about alcohol in compasses, and therefore um, it was a dead end, but it's an important point because this is probably the first time any intellectual conversation between a Japanese person and an English person or an English speaking person happened in history. And therefore, whatever the outcome was, it's quite momentous, I think, especially speaking here today. There were not just compass or marine related um, things to consult with Christopher and his colleagues. The Dutch or the, the um, Flemish uh, apothecary, Jacques Garry Jr. or Lejeune, um, wrote in a letter, I had the Indians that Cavendish brought with him here in my house and showed them the star anise. Um, they didn't know what star anise was, it's hakaku in Japanese. It was a strange herb which had come with some ship somehow, somewhere, uh, a one, and they were needing to find out what this was or whether it was useful in any way. Uh, of course, Christopher and his colleagues were the, the only people in London who had any knowledge at all about these kind of things. One who came from the Philippines called it Damor. I also asked separately the other Indian who also came from those whereabouts, who's Christopher, and he caught, too called it Damor. It is drunk with water, as we do here with anise and water. What Damor means, I couldn't work out. I spent a year or two trying to find some way of con con <laughs> making it work in in any kind of Filipino language, in Tagalog, uh, in Japanese, in Chinese, there's no way I, I couldn't find it. However, what it was is star anise, and we know that because of the the description of it. Then he wrote after this, I also send you the word Damor, written in the Indian's own hand in his own language. He wrote starting from the top and then going down, as you will see from his handwriting. This is Christopher. I know they say Indian, that simply means Asian in this case. This is Christopher being the first ever person to write a Japanese script, any Japanese script in London, the first ever East Asian script in London. Sadly, we don't have the actual document. It was sent to Frankfurt after this. Um, and what happened to it there, uh, we have no clue. It may, may have even have been burnt as recently as the 20th century. But um, again, we have another first here, another first intellectual and cultural uh, event. Then we have a couple of things which are slightly unclear as to whether Christopher did contribute, but everything points to the fact that he did. There is in Hacklet a publication of, there's a chapter called The Large Map of China. This large map of China was brought by Thomas Cavendish and it's printed in detail in Hacklet. There's no map, sadly, so we don't have the map left, but it's printed in detail and it looks like this. It just goes through uh, a whole load of data about China, about cities, about tax, uh, tax rates, about soldiers, about horses, of all the major cities of China. I think this is the Chinese version. It's unclear as to exactly whether it because the translation is not entirely uh, perfect. There was only one person on the ship, possibly two, but probably only one person that could possibly have read Chinese characters. Um, certainly none of the English people could have read Chinese characters to be able to translate the Chinese in some form into English. And that would have been Christopher or perhaps his colleague Cosmos. And therefore, I hold that it's very likely that although his name is not on this map, or the English version of his map, this map, that Christopher had a, a big hand in translating this map, which formed the basis of all English maps of East Asia after this. This was the first ever map of East Asia in London. This is probably the map by a man called Lo Hongxiang, and it had been made probably in the eight, uh, six, uh, 1550s. Uh, it was kind of atlas, actually, rather than a, a full map. And it's uh, printed as a map on one side, and then the, the details uh, of the tax base, etc., the army and military details are on the other side. So 
the map was displayed in Whitehall, uh, it's believed, and it's unfortunately disappeared, but we still do have the description in Hackley. There's also uh, the terrestrial globes of Emery Moulineau, um, which are currently in the Middle Temple Library in London. Uh, Moulineau is believed to have been on the same ship for a whole year from California to London with Christopher and his colleagues. It's fairly reasonable to assume that they were in communication of some sort. The ship is probably smaller than this room, so it really wouldn't have been hard to imagine them, um, them bumping into each other. Um, I did look at this map for quite a long time, at this globe for quite a long time, and tried to work out whether there was any kind of language which I could equate with something that Christopher had written about or somebody had written about with Christopher. I couldn't find it, unfortunately. So I'm going to say there probably wasn't much involvement of Christopher in this, but you can't say for zero, and it's still an interesting story. So I put that in. And they're really wonderful globes. If you get a chance to see them, they are quite something. They're the first ever English globes and they were the biggest ever globes at that time. Uh, nearly, I think it's nearly two meters in circumference. They're, they're huge, yeah, they're like this. Yeah. Okay, what happened next? We've got Christopher in London. We've got um, Cavendish um, rich, but in disgrace, he didn't get his knighthood. Um, there's all sorts of legal cases brought against him. He is accused of piracy or at least doesn't get his um, the bond he's paid for piracy back a little bit dicey what happened next we well, you have to read the book to find out <laughs> no i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking i'll tell you what happened next all right so we know that that we know that um, christopher and his colleague cosmos were supposed to be interpreters uh they were set up to return to Japan and help the English establish some kind of presence in Japan. So the three lads from Manila stayed behind in England and Christopher and his colleague Cosmos um, boarded a ship uh, called Leicester and departed from Plymouth on the 26th of August, 1591. They, I'm gonna, I need to be fairly quick, I think here. So I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. They reached Santos in Brazil. That's where Pele was born. And grew up. Uh, they took Santos. They burnt it, as you can see from this much later Dutch print. Here, yeah, there's lots of fire. And this is not working, is it? Okay, there's lots of fire. Um, they burnt it. They brutalized everybody. They kidnapped the townspeople during midnight mass. It was Christmas Day, by the way. And they took all their food and kept them at uh, gunpoint in the church. Very nice. Uh, then they put them all out into the jungle and they fortified the town. The problem was there wasn't actually much food in the town. And they dillied and dallied for a couple of months, uh, tried to um, take some other settlements and find more food, but they didn't actually manage to get much food. And it was all a big mess, typical English voyage for the time. But there is one poignant moment among this because we have a, an account from a man called Anthony Nivet, who was a gentleman sailor with Cavendish. He became a very, very good friend of Christopher to the extent that if you read this from our first setting out forth from England till we came to Santosh, I had to Christopher the Japon because I found his experience to be good in many things. This Indian and I grew into such a friendship one with another that we had nothing betwixt us unknown together. This is the first ever recorded friendship between an English speaker and a Japanese person. And it's a very cute friendship until we find out that they have a big argument over some money and they're not friends anymore. Uh, I could read this for a long time. There's several uh, references to uh, Christopher in Antony Nivet's account of the voyage. And I took a lot of my details uh, in the book from that account as well as various other accounts as well. We're good on time? Yeah. We're good on time. So they don't have enough food, but they either give up the voyage and return to England in disgrace and, and with no money, or they try their best. So they decide to try their best. They go down Argentina. There's an awful lot of storms off uh, Argentina. Uh, they uh, manage to get to Tierra del Fuego, but they don't get through. 
one ship does get through later on, but unfortunately, uh, it is not the ship which has Christopher on. They fail. There's mutinies. There's battles. There's all sorts of nasty stuff. Many, many, many of them die of starvation, of um, cold. It's astonishing to think of now, but many of them didn't have coats, and they were, they were going into seas with icebergs and snowstorms. They failed. They returned north to Brazil. But in Brazil, the Portuguese and the locals were waiting for them. At various occasions in Portugal, they were massacred. Uh, and in the end, most of them end up dying. But at this point, we have a very, very good um, evidence for Christopher, or possibly his colleague Cosmos, being still alive at this time. John Yates, who is a Jesuit missionary, an English missionary, uh, he went under the name John Vincent because he couldn't go under his own name, wrote a letter in 1593, which is a year or so after these events, um, reporting exactly on what Thomas Cavendish had tried to do and um, pinpointing at one point that um, in the, you can see in the last sentences down here, he sent a, a ship on shore with 26 soldiers for a raid who, except two or three, one of whom was a Japan boy, were all slain by the Portuguese. So we still have some inf uh, information that there was a Japan lad, a Japanese lad um, alive at this point in the voyage. What happened to the other one, we don't know, was, well, I'll come on to that later. Death. So we know that virtually nobody from the 300 odd people that started this mission to get to Japan from England survived. I tried to make accounts of it. Um, the, the records are fairly sparse. Probably around about 30 made it back to England. Christopher's name, neither nor Cosmos's name for that matter, is um, included upon that list. Um, and therefore, we have to conclude that at some point, they both died on the trip. The main points where people died on this trip were the first time trying to get around uh, uh, through the Strait of Magellan, Tierra del Fuego. Uh, dozens of sailors were left to die on the beach or simply died on the ship. Could have been there. The deaths continued as they went north to Brazil. They had no food, they had nothing. Um, starvation disease as well as freezing cold weather and tempests of various sorts sort of many more dozen deaths though it's unclear exactly how many they could have died there on the voyage north attempted raids in brazil of which we just saw one um, example with 26 were massacred um, there was another when 80 died because they jumped off their boat too soon and they were in armor and they literally just drowned before they had reached the sea Re reading the accounts of these voyages is astonishing <laughs> Um, they should have known something about health and safety, but uh, they didn't. Um, the attempted raids in Brazil killed almost everybody else in the crew. Um, eventually, they tried to find San Helena, which is an island in the South Atlantic. They were planning to try and get around South Africa instead. They failed. And sometime just after this, Cavendish dies. It's almost definite that he uh, was a suicide or a self-murderer, as they called it in those days. Um, we're not quite sure exactly where that was, but he did leave his will and last will and testament and a damning report of who was to blame exactly for the failure of his voyage, uh, which made it back to England eventually. Christopher's ship, which by this point was the Roebuck, uh, Roebuck reached England, but we don't know when or how, or exactly how many people were left alive on it. It's just reported about a year later that it was there. So um, we're not quite sure exactly how that went. Somehow, somewhere along this line, among this horrible list of disasters, Christopher would have died. So I come to the, the final part now. Really, I'm, I'm going to stop after this. Uh, his legacy and the aftermath. 
In around 16, uh, 1596, the first ever letter written from an English monarch to a Japanese monarch, or Kunshu, or it's hard to call Hideyoshi a monarch, but the, the leader or the hegemon of Japan was written. It is um, entitled to Taiko-sama, which was Hideyoshi's uh, title. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have the original letter, but we do have the record that it was sent. It didn't ever reach Hideyoshi, um, but it was sent. Uh, and of course, many people today are very conscious of the history of William Adams, the first Englishman to arrive here because of the recent Shogun series and also because his life is of much fascination for many of us. Uh, he arrived in 1600. There is some suggestion that he could have met Christopher. Uh, he was in London at the same time. He was married while Christopher was there. Um, and it was only about a mile and a half, a uh, couple of kilometers perhaps from uh, the place where Christopher is believed to have been staying. So it's within very easy walking distance where William Adams was at the time. Maybe they met, maybe not, we don't know. 1613, of course, the first English ship Clove reaches Japan and sets up a trading factory uh, in Hirado. Um, 1613 to 1623, it wasn't very successful. Um, the products which the English had for sale at the time were mostly wool based. Uh, the English economy was based upon wool and uh, Japan had virtually no use for wool, unfortunately. And therefore the trading factory was not a success. The English asked permission uh, to leave. They were granted permission by Tokugawa Hidetada. And it was supposed to be a temporary leaving at first. Um, it turned into a very long leaving in the end, but they did try 50 years later to reopen trade with Japan. Um, it was not successful, mainly because the Dutch were very happy with their trade in Japan and slandered the English, um, making sure that the Japanese had a dim view of the English in 1673. Trade was um, refused, forbidden, and the English didn't come again, uh, except in various semi piratical raids until 1850, actually it's 1854, the next uh, serious English mission arrives, but the resumption of trade wasn't until 1859. The next Japanese person to meet an English queen was Iwakura Tomomi and Ito Hirobumi as his interpreter and a few others of the Iwakura embassy who met Queen Victoria in 1872. A uh, very, very long time after Christopher was probably the first Japanese person to meet an English queen in 1588. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing story. Uh, before we uh, start our Q&A, I asked my editor, I gave him the details. I said, can you generate AI photo of Christopher? Oh, wow. But he said he couldn't, he needs more time. Oh, so okay. Don't you have any photo of him or some AI or oh just goodness. imaginary photo? Well, I did ask, uh, I asked the internet to do one for me and uh, I put a competition on Facebook and there was a winner. I didn't prepare for this, unfortunately. Um, for news, it's important for us. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you it's go to right. my Facebook page, Thomas Lockley Author, uh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, or even my personal page, uh, Tom Kinosta Lockley, you will see uh, Christopher's face right. uh, on there. Maybe I can try uh, now. I, I'm sorry about <laughs> Thank that. you. Uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand and proceed to the front mic and uh, state your name and affiliation. And uh, please ask question only, short question. Thank you. Yes, please. Please come, come to the front mic, introduce yourself. <laughs> um, great talk, thank you very much. I have a very obvious question. <laughs> I'm Patricia Yarrow from Informasia, and I'd like to know, why were they called by English names, yeah. Christopher and Cosmos? It's like, what's that? This is a very, very good question, and um, of course there's no full answer, we don't actually know why. They're simply recorded as that, hypothesizing that their Spanish names, which they were called by on the ship, were Cristobal y Cosme. Um, whether they had Japanese names, 
or whether they were too young, orphaned or adopted uh, before they were trafficked, is hard to, t well, it's impossible to tell. <coughs> and sadly, because we don't have any information like that, we can't trace much back. But as with other people in different parts of the world, for example, William Adams here was called Anjin. He was given a Japanese name because it was easier for people to say. We consider that unpolitically correct these days, but it was absolutely the normal thing to do in those days, and hence Christopher got his name. <laughs> it wasn't really an answer, but uh, it, it's full of ifs and everything else. I am simply overwhelmed. But, um, my name is Pamela. I'm with Numini Media, Numini.net. It's a social media for leaders to share their knowledge and wisdom. Um, I'm simply overwhelmed by the amount of research that you had to do to come up with all of this. Could you just kind of do a speed, uh, I don't know, a speed summary of uh, like a one minute version of what you <laughs> had to do? Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I can't imagine how you would come up with all of this information. Could you kind of thank give us a thank hint? Thank you, I, I will try. First of all, because I wanted to make sure that people understood that I had done the research properly, there's a chapter or a draft. It's in, the, it's in the notes at the back of the book, so you can find out more details in the book itself. Secondly, um, I was granted a sabbatical by my university, very kindly. Thank you to Nihon University, if anybody's affiliated here. Uh, and I went to England and did the on-the-ground research, looking at all the places they might have lived. Um, to many of the... the um, Christopher um, sources are in the public domain. They're in books. Uh, they're in letters which are published online. It was just my job to bring them all together. Nobody had thought to do that before for m many different reasons. So I don't think I actually went into any dusty archives and found new documents. But I did go to libraries and find dusty books and bring those out and um, worked from those to give the detail to the book. Um, yeah, it was, it was eight years. Uh, my last book was 10 years, so this is faster. Next year, next time I hope to do it in five or six years. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, please. Chris. Hi, my name is Christopher, I'm English. Um, <laughs> Not much of a gentleman either. Um, <laughs> no, com uh, no comment. <laughs> um, you make the parallel in the book between pirates and pl privateers. Yeah. And well, being yeah. English, both of us, um, I was born in Portsmouth, um, mm. all of our pirates, like Cavendish, are revered and there's, you know, they're like national institutions. And I've lived in Japan for 14 years and nobody talks about... Japanese pirates. Uh, if you happen to do the um, uh, bicycle tour in Seto uh, Naikai, you, there is a, an exhibition. Which Murakami. Murakami. Yeah. But why do you think Japan, I mean, he, they were sponsored, as you say, in either this book or, or the, um, uh, the other book, which you should also read, by the way, his other book about the uh, African Thank samurai, uh, is, um, uh, you know, they, they w were official officially uh, sort of sponsored by Oda, um, Nobunaga, etc., sure. to some extent. Okay. So they had to have sure. support, just as our privateers had the support of Queen Elizabeth. Why, why do you think Japan does nothing to... I mean, they were incredibly influential around this region, but nobody talks about Thank it. Thank you. First of all, credit where credit's due. Chris and his son, Tom, helped with some very, very important details about potatoes and their spread around the world, which you will find he's credited with in the book, as well as his son as well. Uh, the first potato in England probably came on Cavendish's ship, uh, which was part of it. So thank you, Chris. On to the pirates. Um, there was no, you're talking in the 1570s and 80s, there was no centralized government in Japan to sponsor the pirates, although Oda Nobunaga co-opted them as kind of mercenary navy types, if you like. Um, it was not the same way as Queen Elizabeth could give a charter to a privateer and say, go out and do your best for the country uh, by 
pillaging, plundering, and all sorts of other nasty stuff. The pirates within Japan were co-opted by other daimyo, but they were never centralized. Um, furthermore, when they went abroad, they had, n well, certain daimyo did license or encourage pirates to eat, both leave Japan and come to Japan. And many of them were Chinese, and a few were Korean. Uh, many from Ryukus as well. Some were even from Luzon, uh, the Philippines. Um, but there was never any official documentation to do this, uh, to say, you are my pirate, go out and do your deed. Um, therefore, the, the, the national consciousness which the English have to identify with our pirate past is not a Japanese national consciousness, it is a regional consciousness, which is why you mentioned the Seto Naike and the Murakami. Uh, if you go to Hirado, for example, you'll see several houses which are supposed to have belonged to certain pirates, um, all next to William Adams' house, by the way. Um, and so you can see those in regional contexts, but not within the national context. And therefore, I think that is the important point there. Does that make sense? We can debate that. It's debatable. All of this is debatable, as most history is. Uh, my name is Hiro Mitsuchi. I'm, I'm a former visiting fellow at the Wade Wilson School, Princeton University, and I'm part partly a historian. But I was so amazed about all, this, all, all the presentation you made. And uh, what made, made you enthusiastic to find all the details and to create this book uh, compared to the story of John Manjiro or something? It's about more complicated, and that, that makes us more interesting, but uh, I wondered where your enthusiasm <laughs> come from. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, where does my enthusiasm come from? Well, I, li I, uh, I, li I like stories. Uh, and there's a, an English author called Simon Scarrow who writes uh, fiction, actually. Um, but he's been writing for 20, 20, 25 years. I remember reading one of his books when I was uh, young, uh, probably my early 20s, and it said that he used to be a teacher, but he couldn't find any books that he liked reading, so he gave up his teaching job to write the books that he wanted to read. And that's always stuck with me. And I think I write the books that I want to read. Um, not so many of them as he has, but um, I don't have that energy. But I do have the enthusiasm, and thank you very much for, for saying that. I would like to write more if I can. And thank you for your question. I'm Sheila Cliff. I'm a kimono influencer, and I'm from the UK. Um, this question really just shows my ignorance, but um, you've really changed my perspective on Elizabethan England. I grew up thinking it was our golden age, <laughs> and I believe that the reason... I stood at the top of the stairs and made speeches to the Amada <laughs> that I was about to beat <laughs> was because actually we were taught in school that we it was our golden we age. Yeah. And we thought that, you know, Drake and all those, Rally and all those people were superheroes. Yeah. And I never thought that. England was in a terrible economic state. I thought it was all fantastic dresses and Shakespeare and all that stuff. Yeah. So my question is, do you think anything has been done to kind of right the education that I grew up with, which is clearly wrong? Well, I grew up with the same education. I remember reading a book called Our Empire Story. I don't know if anybody else has read that. That's a very old English classic. And various other ones, which were essentially acts of propaganda um, during the imperial times um, that started with the Victorians. The Victorians 
had a queen, which was unheard of in 19th century Europe or anywhere really, uh, except for China perhaps, but she wasn't the queen. And um, they had to find something to justify the fact that the woman was ruling over them. So they went back to a golden age of the past, or they invented a golden age, but they found a queen, and that was Queen Elizabeth. Um, I remember reading books when I was a kid saying Queen Elizabeth's court was the envy of Europe, and there were all sorts of beautiful pictures of people from all over Europe coming to bow to the queen. That really did not happen. Uh, it was essentially an invention of propaganda. Um, I'm not trying to put that right. I'm not trying to... I'm not on a mission, but I think we have to actually look at the context of what the reality was and look at the reasons why the English did what they did. If they'd been rich and glorious, they would have been too comfortable to do what they later did, which was to go out and plunder riches from the world. And um, you had to be desperate to do that. And the English at the time were pretty much desperate. And that became the Scottish and the British afterwards as well. Is that, is that an answer to your question? I kind of. Um, do you think anything's changed? Do you think anything's changed? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I defer from answering that question? <laughs> I think the, the, the legends which British people are brought up with, especially English people, about these swashbuckling adventurers who are actually nasty, nasty people means that we do have a belief or we're brought up, tried to inculcate in us a belief that that's all right to go out and trample on people. I think I'll leave it at that. For now. Thank you. Sorry yes, for an please. incomplete answer. Uh, my name is Joshua Dale. I'm a professor at Chiu University. And I wanted to ask a question about one of the techniques you used in this book, okay. that of uh, inventing dialogue, so like uh, picturing the conversations that must have taken place. Actually, I don't think I invented any dialogue in this one. I, really? I, I invented, well, I invented, I conjured up narratives from sources. Okay. Uh, so from the letters, for example, I, from the context and everything that was in there, I put that in and tried to do it. But I don't think I conjured up any words. Okay, I meant Except when scenes. they were quoted, uh, scenes, yeah, let's say Well, scenes, yeah. scenes like when he was helping to decipher the Chinese map, yeah. and it reads like a, like a novel. <laughs> so yes, it's, You're right, yes, I did. Yeah. So okay. I'm kind of, uh, I also write nonfiction, and I'm not saying this out of criticism, yeah. it's more like admiration, because <laughs> I could not do that. <laughs> it's a technique of fiction. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how you decided to put that somewhat you know, non-standard technique into nonfiction. Mm. Um, and when you decided to do it? Did you do it in the first book or in just this book? I'd like to know more about it. I'm curious. That's a good, that's a good question. I hadn't consciously thought that I'd done that, actually. But now you mention it, uh, I'm all red-faced. And, uh, and, yeah, that scene that you mention is a hypothesized scene. I think it is clear. I hope it's clear. I hope I make it clear that that's not... Uh, that's not 100% factual, that that's taken from possibilities. Um, somebody had to translate that map, as I said, and at some point, his English would have, well, we, we, we can pretty much say for definite that he would have had zero English at the time when Cavendish captured him and abducted him, because he'd never been in anywhere near England before, and foreigners simply didn't speak English at that point. Uh, he would have had Spanish, Japanese, obviously, uh, he could one of the biggest questions is why and how he could read or write as an enslaved person. We don't know. But that's a separate point. Um, I think, as I said before, I write the, the things that I want to read myself, and I probably got a little bit carried away with that chapter. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> However, I would like to say that um, I have flagged up the parts which are hypothesized stories or backstories and the points which are actual factual points. So I hope I have, I tried to do that. Thank you very much for your question. Sorry I didn't answer very well in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Cassie. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Wortley, freelance journalist. Uh, I'd like to ask about your researching and writing journey. 
So do you remember when and where you first found the first reference to Christopher? And what were you thinking at that point? Were you thinking this would be a really good book? Or was it a case of just digging deeper and deeper and deeper, and then you uncovered all this amazing uh, information? Uh, thank you very much. The reason I wrote this book is because the previous book, African Samurai, was about a non-Japanese person who did great things in Japan. I wanted the opposite for this book. And I went out my way to find somebody. And as you just said, it was not necessarily at first, oh, wow. It, it, it became accumulative um, over years, in fact. And so at first, he, Christopher is, and Cosmos are not unknown to historians of Anglo-Japanese relations. They are the first. But there's never, they're just a footnote normally. They're not actually described in any kind of detail. Um, so it was a question of looking at that. And then a very good friend of mine, Taiman Screech, who had been, um, many of you know Taiman, who um, had just collected a few references, said, Tom, go with it. And he gave me a page of, of references. And that gave me a really good basis to think, oh, wow, something might happen here. And after that, I found more references, and other people sent me references, as, as in academia people do and research people do. It's kind of uh, cooperative, right? Uh, other people, another lady was writing a book about Cavendish, and so we cooperated and shared information there. And eventually it became, I wouldn't quite say a tidal wave, but uh, it became enough to actually think, oh, there's more than simply one paper here. There's actually a, a book. And I'd been looking for somebody like Christopher to write about, and it seemed like an excellent um, topic. And, um, yeah, I guess he found me in many ways uh, through Tim Screech, of course. So thank you to Tim Screech. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Paul Snowden. Occasionally in this very room I give uh, short talks about Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare was born in the same year as, as William Adams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, he may have had the same opportunities to at least hear about Christopher. But to, yes, who knows? Absolutely. But who knows? Uh, but at just at that time, as you mentioned, Hakluyt was, pos was popular. Uh, um, uh, his name, Marco Polo, had been published in English, so there was considerable interest in the Indies. Mm. Uh, Shakespeare used the word potato, uh, but he never, as far as I remember, he didn't ever write about Japan. He didn't ever mention Japan. Uh, but my, my question is, uh, however, concerns the, the separate group of the embassy to the Vatican. Potential. Uh, yeah. And I've seen a big uh, mural in the in the Vatican Library, yep. f dated 1585, yep. Yep. showing a, a, a parade of Japanese people with Japanese-style umbrellas. Yep. So that was for the Catholic world. That yep. was big news in 1585. Yep. The question is, do you think that new that news that information ever reached England because England had just under Henry VIII performed its first Brexit and uh, <laughs> divorced itself from, from, from the rest of Europe but there was interest in the Indies yeah. and do you think they ever knew about that uh, embassy to, um, to, to the Vatican? Uh, Queen Elizabeth had regular reports, some say weekly reports about the progress of that embassy um, she was very, very jealous that the embassy didn't visit her. Um, and um, it was a point of contention that she was not on the route. So, yes, absolutely. Um, those, to, to rub, the, rub salt into the wound, when they, were, um, when they were presented to the Vatican, the speech was specifically anti-English. It said that the souls gained for heaven from Japan would replace those of 
the Protestants, especially, and it didn't use the word England as far as I know, but the inference was that an island on the other side of the Eurasian continent, the souls gained there for heaven, would replace those sadly lost to base heathenism, uh, which was as what was thought um, in those days. Um, on to Shakespeare, very quickly. Um, there's half a chapter on Shakespeare's references to Cathay, which includes Japan, and the Indies, uh, which includes Japan. And uh, please, as a Shakespearean scholar, I hope you don't find anything wrong in there. That, that was a hard chapter to, to, uh, to um, research, but it was definitely worth it, I think, because it shows just the contemporary uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and there's quite a lot of references to Cathay and the Indies in there, and they're almost all positive as well. So. And the Globe. And the Globe, of course, the Globe. Um, I can't go back now, I don't think, because, well, we're on somewhere else. But the Globe was named after the Globe. Emery Williams Globe was the Globe that the theatre was named after. Uh, did Christopher have something to do with that? Well, probably not, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> I can't say, I can't claim everything for Christopher. Though I wish I could. That would be an amazing claim, wouldn't it? <laughs> we have time for the last question, if you like. Uh, from the students. Do you want to ask? They, they can ask any time, it's okay. <laughs> don't, don't put them on the spot. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Drew. I'm a librarian. I'm also always interested in the research process. Um, are there still things that you're hunting for that didn't quite make it into the book yet? There's lots of things that didn't make it into the book. I mean, it, it was cut down from 120,000 words to 80,000. Um, so that's half a book, <laughs> half a book cut down. Um, if there's any more information anybody has and they'd like to share, maybe it can go into the next ed edition. Uh, if books never, uh, uh, books of this type never finish being written, they, they can always, something always could, yeah, come up. Some, <laughs> you never know uh, what will just explode one day. Um, the book about Yasuke, for example, the African who served Order Nobunaga, the history is still being written. Uh, recently, Assassin's Creed Shadows, which is a very big game I'd never heard of before, um, has recently announced that Yasuke is the lead protagonist in, in the game. And um, nothing to do with me, sadly. Um, but Yasuke's history, for example, is still being written today, the, as we speak right now. And I'd like to think that maybe Christopher could also join in that club. I doubt it, but uh, it would be nice. That is an excellent question. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm a TV correspondent, and I always think about cameras and shooting. Okay. So do you think we can do a story, video story about Christopher? Do you think you can sure. write a special like text for that, and do you think a Japanese company would be interested in having a film about it? If anybody knows of a Japanese company that wants the rights for the book, uh, for translation into Japanese, uh, or any kind of uh, pictorial uh, or movie type thing, then please do not hesitate to get in contact. Thank I think you that was an excellent, excellent <laughs> prompt there. Do you Thank have you some photographs like uh, in the book, or I mean, uh, your own photographs that can be used with copyrights, uh, free, free copyrights? For the book? Yeah. Uh, I have paid for some of the rights for the pictures in the book. Uh, some of them are uh, public domain. All, right. um, all of them are referenced as to where they can be found. Um, okay, I think uh, somebody would be interested. It's a fascinating story. Well, thank you very much. We really enjoyed it very much, and for that I would like to extend give you a one year, one year honorary membership to our club. You have it before, but we are happy to give it to you again. <laughs> Thank you. So please come again and tell us more wonderful story. Thank you very much. I wish I could. I hope I can. Thank you very much. And uh, again for coming and have a nice evening. If you like to come forward and uh, get some books and sign, please. Go ahead. Thank you.